Thank you very much. It's very good to be here at uh, the University of Sussex. I've had a long connection with the university. I used to be very friendly with Professor Brian Goodwin in the biology department, who was a pioneering holistic biologist um, and really blazed a trail for a, a wider kind of biology. Um, and over the years I've been many times, but I suppose most when my son Cosmo was an undergraduate here studying anthropology, and he must have graduated around 2011 or something like that. Uh, he's a musician now. Uh, but I very much enjoyed visiting the university and meeting his friends here. It was very lively. He was very happy here. And, um, um, he's always spoken in the highest possible terms of the university. So I have a warm glow about Sussex. Um, well, today I'm doing something I haven't done before. I've never given a talk before on psychedelics and consciousness. I've given lots of talks on morphic resonance, the extended mind, a whole range of other topics, but not on this particular subject. Um, and the reason I'm doing it now is because I was invited to give this talk by the Psychedelic Research Society, so it seemed appropriate. Um, <laughs> it was also an opportunity for me to think about uh, psychedelics um, in, in, in a new way. Um, I've been very interested in psychedelics ever since I first took LSD around 1970. I was a fellow of Clare College, Cambridge. I was about 28 at the time. And uh, it was a, a transformative experience for me. Um, I'd been brought up in the narrow mechanistic materialism of 20th, 20th century biology. There was no consciousness in the universe. There's only inanimate matter. Everything's just governed by mechanical laws and forces. Biology is nothing but the interactions of molecules and genes and so on. Um, and consciousness is nothing but the activity of the brain, and it's all inside the head. That was I bought into that materialist, atheist worldview as part of my scientific education. But taking LSD um, rapidly propelled me out of it uh, into a very different way of thinking about consciousness. And I got interested in other aspects of consciousness. I took up transcendental meditation soon afterwards. Um, I then got interested in Indian philosophy about the nature of consciousness. Uh, because my lectures at Cambridge, where I studied in physiology, you know, there, were, there were lots of lectures about <coughs> brains and nervous activity and stuff. But when it came to consciousness, all that happened was that one of the lecturers said, well, we won't discuss consciousness, we're mainly just interested in the brain, we leave that to the philosophers, they've got nowhere in the last 2,000 years, whereas <laughs> we're getting on with the job of finding out how the brain works. So uh, that was more or less all I'd heard about consciousness in my education. Um, so this experience had an enormous effect on me, and it has an enormous effect on a lot of people. As you probably know, there have been a variety of surveys about the effect of taking psychedelics on people's worldview. And probably there are a few things that change people's worldview so effectively. Near-death experiences do, and other intense mystical experiences. Uh, but psychedelics have a dramatic effect on many people's worldview. In a survey by Roland Griffiths uh, in the United States uh, of people who'd taken psychedelics, he found that um, before taking it, the group he was testing were mostly people in universities. Physicalist or materialist views, 45% of them had materialist or physicalist views. Um, after psychedelics, that plummeted to 16%. Um, in a study by Davis et al., a similar kind of survey, uh, of the people he surveyed, 28% described themselves as atheists before they had their psychedelic experience, and afterwards only about 10%. So the uh, other surveys have shown that people who've taken psychedelics often have a greater sense of the life of nature, uh, the sense that animals and plants are truly alive, not mere mechanisms, as mechanistic materialism tells us, and um, also a, a sense of greater connection with nature. The studies comparing different psychedelics, the one that has the most effect on connection with nature is magic mushrooms. Um, 
which is not surprising because in a sense they're the most natural I mean, you, you, uh, of the available psychedelics. Um, so the fact my own worldview was changed is not very surprising in the light of this research I only read about much more recently. Uh, it's, I was just sort of average in, in the effects on me. And for me this led to a, a real interest in psychedelic research. And the, when I was in, um, I spent some years working in India. Um, I worked in an agricultural institute in India. I also spent a couple of years in an ashram in South India where I wrote my first book, A New Science of Life, about morphic resonance, about memory and nature. Um, and I was very interested by the different views of consciousness in Indian and in Buddhist thought, because a lot of their philosophy is about the nature of consciousness, uh, and they've taken it further than almost anyone else, partly because the long tradition of people meditating and exploring consciousness through direct experience. When my book, A New Science of Life, was published in America in 1982, it was published by a publisher in California, and so I went to California for the first time, and I was invited to the Esalen Institute in California by Stan Groff, who was a well-known, and still is alive, he's a well-known researcher on LSD and other psychedelics. Um, he gave a month-long program at Esalen exploring the nature of consciousness, and I taught in it for the first, uh, in my first visit there. Um, I also, on that same visit to California, met someone who became a really close friend, uh, Terence McKenna, who some of you will be familiar with. His, uh, Terence died in the year 2000, sadly, but his, he, his, his voice is heard from beyond the grave on um, YouTube and on many on, on the internet. It's amazing how popular his talks still are. Um, and he and I and Ralph Abraham, who's a, a chaos mathematician at the University of California at Santa Cruz, uh, met every year after that for the next 18 years, until Terence died almost. We spent several days together every year, sometimes in England, sometimes in California, once on at Terence's botanic garden in Hawaii. He had a psychedelic botanic garden in Hawaii called, <laughs> called Botanical Dimensions. And, uh, and uh, Botanical Dimensions was full of all known tropical psychedelic plants. He was a great explorer of psychedelics and a brilliant speaker. Um, so there, there are 30 or 40 of these trilogues that were recorded and a few years ago someone found these cassettes in Ralph Ralph's garage and digitized them. They're now online. You can hear them on my uh, website. There's a whole section on the trialogues, uh, audio recordings. There's also a few videotape um, trialogues in which we explored a very wide range of topics. Um, but Terence was, I would say, one of the leading visionaries in the whole psychedelic movement. I also went to a whole series of conferences at the Esalen Institute uh, of, of leading edge psychedelic researchers, including Sasha Shulgin, uh, who helped uh, redevelop MDMA, ecstasy, and a number of other similar drug, drugs. Some of you may have seen his book, PCAL, uh, which means phenyl ethylamines I have known and loved. Um, it, it concludes MDMA. But he developed a whole range of other compounds of that kind. Um, and the, the, uh, the meetings were convened by something called ARUPA, the Association for the Responsible Use of Psychoactive Agents. Um, then, uh, more recently, here in Britain, there's been a lot of psychedelic research uh, at Imperial College and sponsored by the Beckley Foundation. And I'm fortunate to know many of the people involved in that. So um, I've been able to uh, um, learn about what's going on in this field over many years. This, the, the research discoveries, now it's legal again to do research on psychedelics, um, include uh, studies of their effects on the brain. One of the most obvious findings is that they shut down the default mode network, those regions of the brain that are linked together that are concerned with 
the mental chatter, discursive thought, and, and, and the internal dialogue. Um, and that, as soon as that shut down, you become much more present. And they also lead to connections between different brain regions that wouldn't normally be connected. It's not very surprising, really, if one's had these experiences where very unusual things can happen. Um, and more recently, there have been a lot of studies on the therapeutic use of psycho psychoactive substances, for example, psilocybin and its effects on chronic long-term depression and on addiction. Um, these, what's interesting about these studies is that it's not the drug itself working at the purely chemical level that's helping people. And they have much more effective at relieving long-term depression than any of the standard antidepressants or talking therapies. Um, it's not the drug itself, it's the experience it induces. It's really that sense of being connected to a greater consciousness, a kind of mystical insight that changes people. Um, so there are some chemical companies say, well, they're going to try and uh, make versions of these drugs that don't have these undesirable side effects of visionary states, the sense of mystical unity, etc. Just stick to chemicals. Uh, but I think if they do that, they're almost doomed to failure because it's the experience which is what changes people. And sometimes people who've been depressed for 25 years resistant to all known forms of therapy, after a couple of uh, experiences with psilocybin, together with a therapist helping them integrate the, this, uh, uh, have proved much more effective than any other treatment at changing uh, their uh, state. Well, psychedelics have extraordinary effects and lead to a variety of, many of them to a variety of visual effects, as, as many of you will know from personal experience, uh, and also very often have a sense of connecting one with larger forms of consciousness, higher, than, higher forms of consciousness, uh, very often have a kind of numinous quality uh, that makes one feel one's mind is part of something vastly greater. There's a vastly greater consciousness within which all things are embedded and through which they are unified. A kind of mystical vision of connectedness. But then, you see, as soon as you realize that, as soon as you have these experiences, especially most people here, I'm sure, are either at university or been to one, um, a doubt kicks in. Is this real? Uh, because we've all been educated in the physicalist, materialist worldview. It's implicit in the whole of science. Uh, it's based, it, the assumptions underlie almost all scientific research, all research in biology and psychology departments and neuroscience departments. And so we've all been educated to believe that our minds are nothing but the activity of our brains. It's all inside the head. And so how can <coughs> these wonderful visions possibly make sense if they're just illusions produced by disordered brain activity that's been disturbed by chemicals to so nerves fire in an uh, abnormal way, generating hallucinations inside the head. Um, well, it doesn't feel as if that's what's going on if you take psychedelics. It feels that there's something much more important and interesting and uh, that these are real insights. It's not just the hallucinations of a disordered brain. But if you're a physicalist, you more or less have to believe that. And not everyone who takes them changes their worldview. A number remain atheists and physicalists after taking them um, because they're very strongly committed to the phys physicalist ideology. One example is Sam Harris, who made his whole career out of being a, a militant atheist. Um, now run, has a quite interesting podcast that some of you will have heard. But he, uh, last year there was a, an episode when he talked about a mushroom experience he'd had, a psilocybin experience, which he said during the experience itself, he felt as if he was connected to faster, greater consciousness, having deep mystical insights, a uh, wonderful sense of connection with nature, and so on. And he could understand how mystics could get to that <coughs> kind of position and how that could become their worldview, because he'd experienced it himself. He then said, after a couple of days of reflection, he realized that this was nothing but hallucinations produced inside his brain, 
uh, by the chemical disturbance caused by the drug. So he then collapsed all this experience back into the brain and nothing but something happening inside the brain. Professor Anil Seth at this university um, has written about psychedelics in his very interesting book, Being You, uh, where he puts forward, I think, the best defense there is of the materialist worldview. He's an unreconstructed materialist, but he's a liberal materialist. And, of course, he has to interpret his LSD experiences in terms of nothing but changes in the brain. Luckily, he's doing uh, interesting research on synesthesia. Many people have synesthesia, music, can lead to changing images and colors and changing colors. Uh, uh, and many people have had synesthetic experiences with LSD and other psychedelics. I have myself. Um, most of us don't take it any further, but he is doing. And, and uh, I think that his research will help illuminate what's going on in the brain when synesthesia happens. So this is valuable research. But he has to collapse it down to a materialist worldview, because as a professor at Sussex University, I suppose that's what you'd have to be. Um, and so I don't, I've not met him yet. He and I are having a debate in Bergen, Norway, in, uh, in December, which will be streamed online, on the mind beyond the brain. So I've no idea what will happen in our debate, because we've never met. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, so, Anyway, so not everybody who takes psychedelics and has these experiences comes to the conclusion it's telling us something profound about the nature of reality. There are quite a number of people who don't, who think it's just some, telling us something about the functioning of the brain. But most people who take them, who are not deeply committed to the materialist worldview, do think that it's telling us something very interesting about consciousness, and that's certainly my own view. And when we look at consciousness and uh, theories of consciousness, then the, the basic category of types of consciousness um, is, is, the basic categories are quite widely agreed. There's waking consciousness, like now, uh, seeing and perceiving the world immersed in sen the world of sensory experience. Then there's dream consciousness, the kind of consciousness we have in dreams, um, then there's deep sleep, where uh, we lose the sense of ourselves and time and space, and we enter a kind of unified state. And uh, then, even beyond that, in Hindu and Buddhist thought, there's a fourth state of consciousness, Turiya, which means the fourth, um, which is like waking up in deep sleep and being part of a unified consciousness where we're no longer separated from everything else. And this, in these Eastern systems of thought, um, the divine consciousness is, is in or beyond Turiya. Then there's deep sleep, which is this undifferentiated level of the ground of consciousness from which dreams and waking life emerge. And the dreams and waking life have to alternate with deep sleep because it's all part of it's like a wave where you deep sleep and dreams and waking life are all interrelated with each other. You can't just have one without the other. We have to sleep. And uh, no one really knows why we have to sleep. You know, some people say the brain has to repair itself, we need to rest and uh, recover and all that sort of thing. But I think it's very, very deeply embedded in consciousness itself, this alternation of sleep, dreams, and waking. If we ask ourselves, where can we map psychedelic experiences onto this scheme, then the most obvious possibility is that they fit more in the kind of dream type category. They're, not, they're very different from waking life. And if you take them with your eyes open, then you have all sorts of perceptual distortions. And with mushrooms, as many of you may have found, it, it seems as if the earth is breathing and trees and moss and that all seems to come to life. And when I first took LSD, I had a painting on my wall of Apollo and his chariot. And um, Apollo just sort of took off and started <laughs> sailing across the, the wall of the room and uh, out beyond it. And so, um, but with your eyes closed, then there's a realm of visionary experience uh, which is much more vivid than dreams, but I think different in degree rather than in kind. 
um, this is not just my own theory, it's because many other people have suggested this. Um, so I think it's in a sense continuous with dreams. Also continuous with a whole range of other altered states of consciousness. One of it is uh, the visionary state of consciousness, uh, which some people have uh, spontaneously. I mean, not all these altered states of consciousness depend on drugs. There are many other ways of entering them. And visions um, are you know, commonly reported. The Bible is full of them. For example, the book of Ezekiel uh, contains a, a vision where he sees beasts in the sky with four heads. Then he sees huge wheels with eyes all around the rim and wheels within the wheels, other wheels that revolve with eyes. And these are very like psychedelic visions. Um, and the book of Revelation in the Bible, the book of Daniel, are full of visionary experiences which are like psychedelic trips. I'm not suggesting they were induced by psychedelics, but I'm saying they're of a similar kind. And they can occur spontaneously. Some people have visions of the Blessed Virgin Mary or of the saints. Uh, all sorts of visions uh, occur. People who stay in darkness for uh, uh, more than a day or so often have hallucinatory experiences. And uh, the darkness is, in fact, one of the simplest ways of inducing them. In, some, in Tibetan practices, some people go on 30-day dark retreats where they have an intensely visionary experience in these dark places. And I myself think that in those cave art of the you know, 40,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, there were all these caves in Spain and France and elsewhere with paintings in them. But obviously, they would have had to have light to, from torches, uh, from flare, flares or something to do the paintings. But they may well have had periods of retreat in total darkness there, in which they had visionary experiences, not unlike psychedelically induced experiences. Shamans in many cultures induce visionary experiences through drumming, um, and ecstatic states can be induced through drumming and through chanting and through singing, also through dancing. Um, then there are spontaneous mystical experiences. Many people have spontaneous experiences of a connection, connection with a consciousness greater than their own. And, um, Sir Alistair Hardy, who was the professor of zoology at Oxford in the 1970s, um, set up a project to look at the natural history of mystical experiences. He got very interested in this. And as a zoologist, uh, he thought, I think rightly, that the starting point for any investigation is natural history. So he collected, appealed for information through newspapers and through BBC radio, and collected thousands of accounts from people about mystical experiences that occurred spontaneously. Some of them were near-death experiences, uh, some of them were induced by extreme physical distress, uh, but some of them just happened naturally when people were in nature or in a beautiful place or through music or hearing great music in a cathedral or in, in, in religious services. There were a whole variety of ways in which they happened, including to people in childhood. And he was astonished to find there were so many. And later surveys showed that mystical experiences are far more common than anyone had thought. Some surveys put them around 10% of the population, some even as, as much as 50%. And one reason this was surprising is that most people who have mystical experiences don't want to talk about it. They don't even tell their nearest and dearest, or they didn't used to, at least when Hardy was doing this. Many of them said, I'm so glad you asked. This is the first time I've ever written about this. Um, they didn't want to talk about it because they thought if they told people they were seeing visions or having this great sense of unity and so on, that people would think they were mad and, and they'd be certified or sectioned or something. Uh, so they kept quiet because we live in such a deeply secular and anti-mystical culture. So uh, the, these spontaneous mystical experiences. Then Stan Groff, when LSD was made illegal, developed um, what's called holotropic breathing. It's basically a form of hyperventilation which induces visionary states. I've done it myself with him. And uh, it, it can, it, 
it's a very strange effect it has, but it definitely induces visionary and mystical type states of mind. So psychedelics are not the only way of reaching these other states of consciousness, all of which I think are variations on the dream state. And not, I'm not saying they're nothing but dreams, but I'm saying we tap into that realm every night whether we like it or not through our dreams. And in our dreams, we have a dream body. We have another body in our dreams. Every night when we dream, our physical body is lying in bed, but we all have a dream body. Uh, theosophists and various occult philosophers talk about the astral body, which makes it sound terribly mysterious. But I think it's actually much simpler than that. We all have a dream body whenever we dream. When I dream, I can move around, I can talk to people, I can see people, I can sometimes fly. Um, and in my dreams, there's a center of consciousness, which is not my physical body, it's another one, the dream body. And when people have out-of-the-body experiences, then I think it's basically similar to the dream body, um, experiencing uh, moving out of your body. We all experience it every night, every time we dream. Even if we forget our dreams, uh, we're experiencing it. So, I think that these, uh, this realm we experience in dreams includes archetypal patterns. Jung uh, thought about the collective unconscious and patterns in the collective unconscious that were archetypal forms um, which are part of a collective memory. We meet other people in our dreams, deceased ancestors, friends, strangers that we've never met before, weird figures, fantastical creatures. Uh, so dreams have a whole range, they're populated, they're not just blank, and they're not just colored patterns, they're, they're populated with entities of one kind or another. And so are psychedelic experiences for many people. So I think there's a, a great deal of overlap, as I say, between these different altered states of consciousness. It's been thought in many cultures that it's important for people to experience these altered states of consciousness because it tells us something about the deeper nature of reality. It's part of growing up uh, to realize that this, this is part of the world we live in, that it has these other bigger dimensions of consciousness. And in most cultures, traditional cultures, they have rites of passage uh, where people are inducted into this wider view through experience. Rites of passage very often involve themes of death and rebirth. You die to your old self and you're born in a new way. Um, so they can be brought about in, in, in different ways. For example, in some parts of North America, they had vision quests where people would spend days fasting in the wilderness uh, in, and enter altered states of consciousness through the the sheer stress of being in, in the wilderness, fasting uh, in unfamiliar conditions, in dangerous conditions. Uh, some had near-death experiences. And people were transformed by this. I think that the death and rebirth theme is actually quite close to our own culture. Um, if you remember from the New Testament, we read about John the Baptist, uh, who was baptizing people in the River Jordan. People were flocking to the Jordan from all over the Holy Land to be baptized by total immersion. And you can go today to see the baptismal site. It's on the Jordanian side of the, of the River Jordan. I've been there myself, and it's very impressive. There were whole lots of Byzantine temples and, and churches there. It was a major place of pilgrimage. And for those of you who are familiar with the Old Testament, there's the prophet Elijah, the Old Testament tells us, uh, was crossed the River Jordan, which opened the water parted to let him cross the River Jordan from the Israel side. And with him was Elisha, his disciple. And Elisha said to him, will you pass on your mantle as a prophet to me? Can you inherit your mantle? And he said, I don't know what's going to happen, but um, if, if I leave my mantle behind, yes, it's yours. And then the story says, a, a chariot came from heaven and carried off Elijah into the heavens. So Elijah didn't die in the normal way. And both in Christianity and in Islam, 
There are many stories about Elijah. In, in, in Islam, he's Khidr, he's the green man, uh, who mysteriously can appear through history um, can, because he didn't really die. And this is all visionary stuff. And the very place where Elijah crossed and ascended into heaven is the very same place that John the Baptist was baptizing people in the River Jordan. They were lining up on the banks, I imagine, because they were coming from all over and could only do one at a time, um, and he held them under. Now, the usual assumption is that he was holding them under to do something that was symbolic of death by drowning, followed by rebirth. But in my view, it doesn't really make much sense to do it just symbolically, when for a couple of minutes longer, uh, you could do, have the real thing. And I suspect that John the Baptist was holding them under just long enough to induce a near-death experience by drowning. Very low-tech, very quick. He may have lost a few, but um, <laughs> that was before litigation, and, um, so, and health and safety. Um, so uh, it, it all makes sense if you see it in that light, because what they were doing was experiencing that they'd died, they'd seen the light, and they'd been reborn. That's what happens in near-death experiences. People feel, you must have read about them, probably everyone's read about them, but if you haven't, very briefly, what people experience is floating out of their body, often seeing themselves from above with operations going on in an emergency room in a hospital, for example, then going through a kind of tunnel um, into the light, and they enter a region full of joy, which feels joyful, blissful, full of light, with beings of light, often deceased relatives or other beings of light who welcome them. And so, uh, and then people who've had near-death experiences often change. The, the surveys have shown that many people who've had them feel that they've died and been reborn, and they've seen the light, they've lost the fear of death, and they become much more spiritual and much more altruistic. They're, they're changed in a matter of minutes by these uh, near-death experiences. And near-death experiences are more common today than they've ever been before, thanks to coronary resuscitation, defibrillators, you know, intensive care, and so on. A lot of people who even 50 years ago would have just died and are brought back to life again, and a quite high percentage of them have near-death experiences. Near-death experiences are partly culturally conditioned but they have great similarities across cultures as well. So, my idea is that, and not just me, other people think this too, that um, if John the Baptist held them under just, I don't know how long it takes, two minutes, three minutes, um, he could induce near-death experiences by drowning, their lives would be completely transformed. This happened to Jesus because in, in the, what, the first appearance of Jesus after his childhood, um, in the Bible, is his baptism by John the Baptist, who is his cousin. And Jesus goes there, he's baptized by John the Baptist, and when he comes up from the water, he realizes that he's deeply connected to God. He hears the voice saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And um, uh, the Holy Spirit descends on him. After that, he spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness on a kind of vision quest before he began his public ministry. But it started with this mystical experience induced by, a uh, near-death experience induced by baptism. In the early church, people started baptizing infants by sprinkling water on them, and it be did become merely symbolic. But in the ferment of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, uh, some of the most radical Protestant groups were the Anabaptists. Anna means again. And there are people who thought infant baptism wasn't good enough. If you read the Bible, which people could because it had been translated and the printing press had just been invented. Until then, people didn't. They couldn't. It was in Latin. And there weren't printed books. But the Reformation was very much influenced by the ability to read the Bible and to uh, have printed books. And when they read the Bible, they found that Jesus himself was baptized by total immersion in the river, Jordan. That was what John was doing. So they started doing it again. And Anabaptists in the 16th and 17th century were uh, 
well, they were made fun of by lots of people, but they were feared by lots of people, because what they did was they went around saying they'd died, they'd seen the light, they'd lost the fear of death, they'd been born again. They're the origin of born-again Christians. That's what it was about. And I suspect that all of this was literally true for them. Uh, it wouldn't have made any sense. They wouldn't have got into that vivid sense of total transformation of their lives through something that was merely symbolic. I don't know how long uh, they went on doing this, but Baptists is still baptized by total immersion. And in uh, the Baptists here in Britain and Germany and other, else, other parts of Northern Europe were persecuted because they didn't follow normal church rules, they didn't accept normal authority, they felt they had this direct experience of the divine through uh, their near-death experience. Um, and so they were persecuted, and, and so it wasn't much fun for them in Europe, so they went to America, and uh, they're still there in very large numbers. Um, and uh, the in interesting thing about Baptists is, is that they, the thing on which their whole religion really centers is this conversion experience, this visionary experience of, uh, at baptism of seeing the light and being born again. And I think that at least in the early stage it was probably literally true. Now I think what's interesting and the reason I bring this up is that in the modern world we've lost rites of passage. Uh, we still have ones that are, are symbolic like our mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs for Jewish people or confirmation for some Christians. Um, but on the whole, our culture lacks effective rites of passage. And I think what's happened is that for many young people, um, mainly young people, uh, psychedelics have taken on that role. They have a transformative effect on many people, as I already mentioned. And they often involve a death and rebirth motif. Stan Groff did a great deal of research he, on, on this in the 1960s and 70s when it was still legal. And based on the accounts of trips by more than 2,500 people, uh, he found that it was quite common for people to have near-death experiences. Basically, they would feel themselves trapped in a, situa in a situation that was oppressive, painful, distressing, a really bad trip. They felt trapped, imprisoned, etc. Then they'd have an experience of going through a tube or a tunnel and emerging into the light, and it, where, where it was blissful, joyful, beautiful, and so on. Um, and Stan Groff found that this was a very common archetypal pattern in psychedelic experiences, very similar to a near-death experience. Um, he interpreted it, uh, he was a Jungian, and he interpreted it as an archetypal experience of birth. All of us, when we were in our mother's womb, spent almost nine months floating around uh, in a fairly blissful state with nothing to worry about. But then came a moment when contractions began and we were no longer welcome in the womb. And we were compressed and it was really a painful and stuff. And the only option was to escape through a tube, a dark tube, into the light. And he thinks that this archetype is so deep that people, in a sense, relive it through these um, rebirth experiences. Even if they've been born by a caesarean section, the d archetype of that birth process is so deep in our consciousness. And of course, it's true not just of humans, but of all mammals. Our mammalian ancestors, going back a hundred million years, have been born through passing through the vaginal passage, the birth canal. So Stan Graf's interpretation, I, I find really very interesting one. And it's not only LSD that induces near-death type experiences. Um, some people have them with ketamine, uh, which leads to out-of-the-body type experiences. Uh, I myself I have a medical friend in uh, America who was doing research on ketamine. It was part of a research project, so I volunteered. And uh, yeah. uh, for me, it was the most extraordinary experience. I mean, it was very protracted out-of-the-body type experience through different spaces. It was a remarkable experience. It's slower motion than the LSD experience that I had because I, when I read Stan Graf, I realized my first LSD experience was actually more or less as he described. I felt myself trapped 
in, in, uh, I felt I was just trapped forever in an area I'd never escaped from. I thought I'd gone mad. I thought, then I thought I must be in hell, and then neon signs lit up all around me saying hell, so that proved it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I, I, I was, felt just as if I'd never escaped. It, it was, but I had to get out, I wanted to get out, and then an opening happened, I found myself just going up as if I'd been deep in the water, going up through the water, and then bursting out into the light, and everything was blissful and joyful, and Mozart piano concerto turned into the most beautiful forms and shapes, constantly changing, and, and so on. At the time, I knew nothing of his research, but I realized I'd had this myself. And the other substance that many people experience something like a near-death experience with is DMT, dimethyltryptamine, which uh, is, as you'll know, a fast-acting, very fast-acting uh, psychedelic. The first time I took it was with Terence McKenna, um, and he uh, gave me this DMT, a high dose. Uh, comes on almost instantly. I found myself shooting through the center of a chrysanthemum flower, like a kind of tunnel experience through a flower, um, into a realm which was a realm of exquisite beauty, uh, of shimmering forms like flower petals everywhere, and utterly blissful. And then it seemed I'd been there for ages, and it seemed then as if I'd come back at like a million miles from somewhere totally different, and then re-entered my body. And um, it was very like a near-death experience, as I've, I haven't had an actual near-death experience. Um, when I described it to Terence, he said, uh, you've been to the flower heaven. Um, so the, he had a kind of category of the different places people went to, and I'd been to the flower heaven which since I started out as a botanist, and I love flowers, which is quite appropriate for me. Um, so, some people who've had actual near-death experiences and taken DMT or other psychedelics have said that there are many similarities. They've always said there are some differences as well, because in the near-death experience, people uh, very often meet ancestors or parents or people they know beings of light who welcome them. That's not so often the case with psychedelic experiences. So there are a number of differences. Now, I want to say something about the historical importance of these altered states of consciousness. Terence McKenna, as some of you will know, um, was the original author of what's sometimes called the stoned ape hypothesis. Now, the stoned ape hypothesis is that early humans discovered magic mushrooms and started taking them, and the alteration in their state of consciousness totally changed their nature, and humans invented religion, mythologies, and all that kind of thing, thanks to psychedelics, that they shaped human evolution. Well, I think that that's a little bit going a bit too far myself, um, because there are many ways in which you can alter states of consciousness. There are mystical, uh, spontaneous mystical experiences, experiences in the dark through fasting, as I've already mentioned. Many other ways of getting into altered states of consciousness. But there's no doubt that in some cultures, um, psychedelics are traditionally used in shamanic contexts. Um, like, uh, and they've, they do have a long cultural history. But it's only a minority of cultures uh, it's not all cultures. Um, so I think Terence's hypothesis has to be generalized to include other altered states of consciousness. All religions, as my main spiritual teacher, Father B. Griffiths, used to say, start with mystical experience, a uh, connection with a consciousness greater than our own. Um, the Buddha didn't become enlightened by doing a PhD. He became enlightened by meditating under banyan tree or pipal trees for many years, and uh, it was through his direct experience. Jesus didn't uh, become aware of his spiritual nature through studying at a rabbinical seminary. Uh, he became aware of it first, at least in the biblical report, through his baptism and the experience that followed it. So changes in consciousness through various means, I think, do underlie the sense that's present in all cultures, except modern, secular, Western Europe, um, are that there are realms of conscious realms beyond our own. 
ultimate spirit or God or ultimate principle of consciousness, uh, which Hindus would call Brahma, or with its forms of Sat, Chit, Ananda, being consciousness, bliss, um, other forms of consciousness, and then many kinds of beings between the ultimate consciousness and our own. Angels, spirits, deceased ancestors, the spirits of saints, um, demons. Uh, this is a heavily populated realm. Uh, and the fact that we find similar visions of different kinds of beings, including animal spirits, in so many cultures is because these are real experiences that have a huge effect on the whole culture. They've been very much suppressed in our culture. The mechanist, materialist, rationalist worldview uh, just says all this stuff, it ex if it exists, they're just meaningless hallucinations or folk tales or superstitions um, and you just need to get on with a proper rational attitude towards life and forget all that nonsense. So it's very much a very limited, truncated view uh, that we've been, all been brought up with. Um, so if we look at how our own culture has been shaped, the two main ingredients that have shaped it are the philosophy of ancient Greece, which came to us through the Roman Empire and through the great emphasis on Greece in, in our cultural history and our cultural mythology. And the great philosophers of Greece, um, many of them, had psychedelic initiations. The Eleusinian Mysteries at the Temple of Eleusis near Athens uh, involved taking what everyone agrees was a psychedelic brew. The dispute is as to what was in it. Uh, I'm particularly interested by a recent theory of Brian Morarescu, who thinks that they uh, were forming a, having a kind of beer made from barley uh, which had been infected by ergot. Ergot is the lysergic acid, LSD, is a derivative of ergot. That's why it's ergic, lysergic acid. And uh, ergot is normally poisonous and induces uh, all sorts of undesirable effects. But his theory is that they found a way of purifying it so that they could have the active principles, the visionary principles, without the toxic ones. Um, whether he's right or not, I don't know. But he argues that the original psychedelic brews were based on beers. They later became based on spiked wines. And in ancient Athens, there was a switchover. Alcibiades, who appears in Plato's dialogues, was prosecuted for blasphemy because he started serving the active principles from Eleusis in wine at dinner parties uh, rather than uh, in the proper ceremony in beer. Um, Morarescu thinks that some early Christian groups were using spiked wine, which was psychedelic in its effects, um, and they were often accused by their opponents of wild parties and, and uh, unruly behavior, which he thinks was induced by the use of visionary wines as part of the Eucharist, bread and wine. The wine wasn't just a tiny sip of regular wine, it was something much more effective. Um, there are now uh, some interesting psychedelic churches that some of you may have read about. The, there's, in North America, there's the Native American church, which uses peyote cactus containing mescaline as a kind of sacrament. And in Brazil, which is a kind of hothouse of uh, religious and spiritual innovation, I think of it as the India of the Americas. It's a tremendously inventive place in spiritual and psychic forms. And, and there, there are several psychedelic churches. The one I've come across personally is Santo Daime, which is uh, based in uh, a little community in the jungle uh, near, uh, called Mapia. And Mapia is in Acre province. And it started as a Christian vision um, of Our Lady as Queen of the Forest, a green form of the Blessed Virgin, who's the patroness. And in their services, they take um, drink ayahuasca from a kind of chalice and people line up um, and one by one drink it and the whole group then has a collective experience with periods for um, individual visionary activity but also singing together and chanting together and this um, interesting psychedelic church uh, involves people seeing visions of angels of saints it, it makes Christianity truly visionary again 
for the participants. Um, it, it has, they've now spread all over the world, so there are underground um, gatherings of this church here in Britain, uh, but it's illegal here, so they have to be underground. In parts of the United States, it's now legal, and in Brazil, it's legal. Uh, so it's, it, it flourishes there, and, and there are several other psychedelic churches as well. Now, I just want to say one or two things about entities. There's recently been quite a lot of discussion and research on so-called entities, that people on psychedelic experiences meet beings. Terence used to talk about machine elves. Um, so people meet bizarre beings, including cartoon-like characters, but also beings with human and animal characteristics, uh, saints and angels, uh, deceased ancestors, all sorts of beings uh, it, it, uh, are encountered as entities. So, and there's a lot of debate at the moment. I went to a symposium two or three years ago on, just on entities and DMT experiences with DMT and ayahuasca. Um, and the question was, are these just figments of individual imagination? Are they hallucinations like characters in dreams? Or do they have an autonomous existence? Can they be shared between different people? To, are these, some people would say they are Jungian archetypes that are shared experiences. And there's no doubt that people can have culturally shared experiences of entities. Um, I would try to do research on this just in relation to normal dreams. And I thought a good place to look would be in, in India, uh, Ganesh. Ganesh is uh, supposed to be the son of Shiva. He's the elephant-headed god, a human body with an elephant head. He's a very beloved god in India. Um, but clearly Ganesh couldn't really have existed. And some Hindus say, take it literally and say, oh, it was just early Hindu surgeons who did head transplants from elephants. But it's not very plausible to take it literally. Uh, he's a kind of archetypal form. You see Ganesh everywhere in India, on calendars and on in statues and pictures and so on. And lots of Hindus dream of Ganesh. And I found online there are Hindu Ganesh dream discussion groups uh, where people all share their experiences of Ganesh in dreams. So is Ganesh just an individual hallucination or has Ganesh taken on some kind of autonomous existence that goes beyond any particular individual? Um, and could some of these beings actually be the spirits of deceased ancestors when they appear to be? Could they actually be deceased ancestors? Could angels that people encounter actually be angels, uh, which have always been believed to exist independently in a kind of independent psychic reality, independent conscious realm uh, that we tap into through dreams and visionary experiences? Or are they merely human products? Well, that's the debate. I've been to a couple of meetings, actually, the first at Tyringham and the other one at Broughton Hall in Yorkshire, uh, discussing entities. And, and there are, these are the two main schools of thought. Uh, I myself think they may well be autonomous entities, uh, autonomous uh, beings that inhabit a kind of um, conscious world beyond the, our normal waking state. And this then ties in with a final question I want to raise, uh, which is about death. In most cultures, it's believed that when you die, that's not the end. If you're a materialist, of course it is, because the brain is the source of consciousness. And as Professor Seth says on page one of his book, Being You, when you die, it's just oblivion. He doesn't argue the point. He takes it for granted. Um, it's just part of that paradigm. But most cultures have assumed that when you die, it's not just oblivion. Um, some of them, like the Tibetans, who've thought about this more than most, think that you go into a dreamlike intermediate zone, the bardo. And many Tibetans practice what they call dream yoga, which is basically lucid dreaming. Learn to wake during dreams so that you become conscious of what's going on and you can control the dream. The reason they do it is because they think the bardo is like a dream state. And if you know how to navigate dreams, you won't be confused and, and distressed by when you die in the bardo. That's what the Tibetan Book of the Dead is all about. Um, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, 
you see great, a great light. And if you've been trained through meditation and so on, you go into the light, and then you're released from karma, from the cycles of rebirth, <coughs> and so on. But most people are terrified of the light, they turn away from it. Then they have a second chance with the dimmer light, and further chances. And um, if they turn away from all of them, then their, their mind sort of goes back to default uh, sort of fantasies, including sexual fantasies. They then sort of being disembodied, float around and become voyeurs when couples are making love, and then uh, get uh, trapped in a womb, and they're then reborn. Um, so it all makes great sense from the Tibetan point of view, you see, but I think that this model of the afterlife as a kind of dream state is very similar to the uh, Christian idea of purgatory, which is an ongoing existence after this life, which is similar to ours in some ways, but which you can go beyond. As the classic map of all this is in Dante's Divine Comedy, where um, his first journey is to the Inferno, where these people who are dead, but they're trapped in their obsessions. They're people who have been so obsessed that no light could get in, and they're just repeating these obsessions, and they're trapped in hell. Then he goes through hell, down to the centre of the earth, and out the other side, um, and um, to Mount Purgatory, and he climbs this mountain of purgatory, where people who are still trapped with various obsessions are, are, are people who have ask for the light or help to go beyond them, and are working through them until they can escape from them, go to the top of Mount Purgatory. And then the third book, Paradiso, uh, they float off the top of Mount Purgatory, they're no longer confined to a kind of dream body. They float off into the light, which is full of beings and angels and so on. And actually, the, the, if you read Paradiso, it seems to me very like a DMT trip in slow motion. Um, it's, uh, it seems to be describing a state of consciousness uh, that goes into the light, into a much more unitive state of consciousness. Well, in our, we're used to the idea that you know, nothing in life after death, we've been, most people have been brought up with a kind of secularist view. I think it's very important to remember the dead and to recognize the possibility that we will continue after we die in some kind of dream state or even like a kind of psychedelic trip, but from which you can't wake up because you no longer, you no longer have a body to wake up in. Um, I think it's important to remember the dead. This is the season of the dead. All Souls Day was on November the 2nd. Um, my sons, Merlin and Cosmo, are currently in Mexico. They went there for the Day of the Dead, where this is in Oaxaca, where this is a huge celebration in Mexico. It's a really big sense of connection with the dead. There's one day in the year when the, the, the day it's easier for the, um, to communicate both ways, uh, between, between the living and the dead. And then, of course, we have Remembrance Sunday, this coming Sunday, which is why some people wear poppies like this, um, which is about remembering the war dead and helping those, their families who are still alive and who've lost uh, a loved member of the family. So this is the season of the dead, and um, I think that psychedelics and these altered states of consciousness can help to illuminate what may happen when we die. Of course, we'll never know for sure. Um, until we're actually dead, but I myself expect to be in some state of that kind, a dreamlike or psychedelic-like state uh, when I die. It may alternate with sleep, of course, because dreams alternate with sleep, but uh, you could say that the standard atheist view of total oblivion is also based on the sleep metaphor, but it's based on the idea that you just go to sleep and never wake up. Maybe you do. And, and, and so it's good to be prepared for it. Well, um, I think that what's happening here, and finally, is, is to... That we're, this is part of a widespread paradigm shift. Some of you may have seen my book, The Science Delusion, where I deal with the ten dogmas of mechanistic materialism and show how the sciences are bursting out of them. Some of you may have seen my TEDx talk on the subject, um, which was actually organized by three undergraduates from Sussex University. So uh, there's a Sussex connection with that. Um, there's also many studies now on spiritual ex and religious experiences, uh, scientific studies, thousands of peer-reviewed papers, basically showing that 
people who have spiritual and religious practices are on the whole happier, healthier, and live longer than those that don't. So presumably the reverse is true. Um, if you don't have them, you're unhappier, unhealthier, and live shorter. Which is why I think militant atheism should come with a health warning. Because <laughs> um, um, it puts people off their traditional uh, religious or spiritual practices and offers very little in return, except a feeling that you're smarter than everyone else and you've seen through all these superstitions and illusions. Not a very consoling thought and in a depressing materialist worldview of a pointless universe headed nowhere. Not surprising that depression is the endemic disease of modern secular societies. Um, in my books, Science and Spiritual Practices and Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work, um, I, in each book I discuss seven different spiritual practices which have been studied scientifically, including meditation, singing and chanting, prayer, pilgrimage. Uh, and in this book I have a chapter on spiritual openings through cannabis and psychedelics. You'll notice the cover is of a flower through which, uh, I mean, uh, this portal, the idea of the center of flowers, a portal, is for me a d deeply meaningful one because of my own DMT experience. Um, anyway, um, I think what's happening at the moment is there's a paradigm shift going on as we burst out of mechanistic materialism and come to a much wider view of consciousness, a much wider view of the life of nature. Nature is no longer just dead mechanical stuff we can exploit. The climate change crisis forces us to think about our relation to the natural world in a new way. There have been a lot of studies now of near-death experiences, of end-of-life experiences, much more interest in the dying process. It's no longer seen as a failure of medicine, but as a natural process. And through hospices and so on, uh, people can now die in a way that's not just treated as a failure of medicine in intensive care. Uh, but accepting it and, and, and going through a dying process in a much more traditional way. Um, and part of this also involves seeing the whole world as alive. Uh, many of the various things in the world, animals and plants, as having kind of minds of, of their own. I recently wrote a paper called Is the Sun Conscious? It's in the Journal of Consciousness Studies, it's on my website, arguing that uh, the sun may be conscious, and so may the stars, and entire galaxies may be conscious. The stars are like cells in the body of galaxies. Maybe the whole cosmos is conscious, which is a very traditional view. It comes in Plato, among others, and Plotinus, the great Neoplatonist. So I think we're on the threshold of a really new phase of our culture. And I think that psychedelics and psychedelic research are playing a very important part in it, because uh, they're very effectively changing the way people see the world, much more effectively than endless books or papers or scientific data, because it's a direct, immediate experience. And that's what changes us. It's the experience that changes us. And we can make, try and make sense of it, and I think we have to try and make sense of it through reason, through science, which I totally believe in. I you know, spent my whole career as a research scientist, and I'm still doing a lot of research. Um, with several papers in the press right now. Um, so, but I think we're on the threshold of this really big change. So that's what I'd like to end with. Thank you. like to ask a question, please raise your hand and I'll come to you. Um, but first of all, that was an incredible talk. Thank you very much. Um, Just to bring up something in the previous book, how would you connect the psychedelic experience with um, the present, for instance? What connection and do you think 
Uh, the questions about psychedelic experiences and morphic resonance. I haven't talked about morphic resonance this evening, but for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's the idea there's a kind of memory in nature. Each species has a kind of collective memory. The so-called laws of nature are more like habits. And our own memories um, are not stored inside our brains, as the materialist theory says, has to say, because everything has to be material, so memories must be material inside the brain. Very little evidence that they actually exist, these memory traces. I think our own memory depends on resonance with ourselves in the past across time. Morphic resonance is a resonance on the basis of similarity across time. I think it relates to psychedelic experiences in several ways. Firstly, I think that the archetypes, or these basic shared collective patterns that Jung called archetypes in the collective unconscious, are part of this collective memory maintained by morphic resonance. Um, secondly, uh, I think that the, the actual psychedelic experiences themselves have morphic resonance. So if you take ayahuasca, for example, then I think because the ayahuasca changes your brain in a particular way and changes your whole physiology in a particular way, you'll resonate, morphically resonate, with previous people who've taken ayahuasca. So there'd be a kind of morphic field for each of these drugs, for, for the experience, which would be conditioned by the culture in which it's been taken. So, for example, with ayahuasca, where it's an Amazonian drug, often associated with myths about jaguars and snakes. Uh, so Claudio Naranjo, a, a Chilean psychologist, gave ayahuasca to middle-class urban people in Chile who knew nothing about Amazonian mythology. And many of them had images of jaguars and snakes. Now, it's highly unlikely that ayahuasca molecules, DMT and, and uh, harmaline, uh, could actually induce that specific kind of vision. It's much more likely that it put them into resonance with people who'd had that cultural experience, and they'd been imbued with that kind of mythology. So I think that's another way. And the third way in which it's relevant is to the question of um, life after death. If memories are stored in the brain, as usually assumed, then clearly when you die, all your memories will be wiped out. So there'd be no conceivable form of individual survival, either in, as reincarnation or purgatory or anything else. Um, if your memories are not stored in the brain, then death isn't going to wipe out the memories. It may wipe out the ability to retrieve them, but it's not the memories themselves. And I think we all tune into the memories of lots of people who are now dead. Um, um, that's what the collective unconscious is. Uh, so the, the morphic resonance theory leaves open the question of survival of bodily death in a conscious form, whereas the materialist theory slams the door shut and says, no, it's totally impossible. All these religious beliefs are absolute rubbish and people are just deluded, they can't possibly happen. Near-death experiences don't tell you anything about actual death, they're just the hallucinations of an anoxic brain, and so on. Um, so I think it, 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 those are the main ways in which it's relevant to psychedelic experience. I can't hear you. Can you? Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. I had a few more questions. The first part was around the recent research that's been going on ever since 2012 that's been confirming that although um, the media keep telling us that uh, psychedelics uh, are increased in brain activity, they light up the brain like a Christmas tree, and over the last few years it's been shown that it's really the opposite is true, and there are decreases in brain activity across all of all modes. Uh, especially with the people who are there, but um, immediately trying to put the same sort of idea that it's actually an increase in their activity. Um, with, with, with this sort of leaked information of um, brain activity in, uh, in these studies, is, is it likely to sort of make it to start pushing against people such as Sam Harris or other people who believe that, oh, this is just hallucinations, even though it's true, providing what we actually experience and what we actually experience is that they'll never experience in their life. Um, is this sort of one of the final nails in the coffin? Or is there another way for physicalism and materialism to move its way out 
this one to this person to the brain activity? Well, the brain activity does a decrease in activity of the default mode network. You know, there's increase in some other kinds of activity. Um, so, I don't personally think that the brain activity studies tell us that much. Um, obviously, the brain's involved and, and the drugs are acting on neurotransmitters, that's why they work. Uh, I don't think they tell us very much about the content of the experience. And so, uh, what many people think, you see, materialists say the brain produces consciousness and therefore brain activity must be correlated with consciousness one to one. But um, the traditional view is not that, it's that consciousness works through the brain um, and that there are forms of consciousness, that higher forms of consciousness that can work through our brains. And the usual interpretation of mystical experiences is not that our brain produces these experiences, it's that they're always there, available to us, but we normally block them out because we're so busy worrying about all the things we worry about, um, with, uh, obsessed with our own fantasies and so on. So we block them out. But if, if we shut down the bits of the brain that block them out, um, then uh, they can come through. So I personally prefer the idea that their experience is coming through and that the effect on the brain is really to permit these experiences to come through rather than blocking them out through our normal mental activities. Of course, if with people's worldviews, you can't, in the end, persuade them just through logic. I mean, it's really experience that we'll have to tell, which you have to tell in the end. What I find perverse about the materialist point of view is that it claims to be based on science, reason, and empirical evidence. Empirical evidence means literally the evidence of experience. The Greek word empirical, it, says, it means experience. So if you're going to have empirical evidence about consciousness, it has to be based on conscious experience. And to dismiss conscious experience in favour of an ideology that says it's all about molecules and, and a consciousness doesn't do anything, it's just an epiphenomenon of the brain or an illusion produced by brain activity, it seems to me utterly perverse and deeply anti-empirical. Um, we spoke a lot about um, all the psychedelics together, and I just want to maybe pick some apart and wondering if you've explored Andrew Gallimore's work, looking at the. Sorry, what? Explored what? Andrew Gallimore's work. Oh, the yes. Because um, he mentioned this unified state, but from my understanding of uh, Gallimore's work, the effect that DMZ has on the brain isn't necessarily this same unifying state that we see in something like psilocybin. But it's more actually providing a different paradigm of brainwave states. I'm just wondering what you thought about that in comparison to other psychedelics. Well, I did talk about them all sort of rather lumped together. Um, and I think that what's, what, what the LSD, psilocybin, and DMT have in common is that they induce highly visual experiences. They induce different kinds of visual experiences and perhaps a different sense of unity. The thing that, to my mind, stands out from all the others is 5-methoxy-DMT, um, which is non-visual. It's incredibly intense. It's short-lived short like DMT. Um, this is the toad venom um, compound. It can be made synthetically or it occurs in, in, in the Sonoran Desert toad in the excretion of its glands. And 5-methoxy-DMT is... is it, I've only taken it once, but the uh, experience I had was uh, completely non visual It was like just going into the presence of God. It was a totally unifying, uh, direct, sort of hyper-mystical experience um, of extraordinary unity, uh, but with no visuals at all. So I'm sure that if Gallimore looked, um, he probably has looked at 5-methoxy-DMT, that would probably have a different pattern. And I think the value of his research, it, Gallimore is actually a, a fairly hardcore materialist, um, but that does mean that he focuses his attention on the brain, and that's helpful, because if you really are totally into the mystical experience, you're not very interested in the brain details. Um, 
But I, I think, it, yes, it's important to look at the differences between these different compounds. And as I mentioned earlier, some studies have shown that psilocybin is much more than other ones that gives a sense of connection with nature. I personally find taking it outdoors in, in daylight is, is, gives a really strong sense of connection with nature and the life of nature. Um, so I think we have a lot more to discover. I mean, that's why psychedelic research is going on and why Sussex University has a psychedelic research society. Because we don't know all the answers. and This is really probably near the beginning of understanding more about them. I'm sure you're aware recently that there was a um, hundred or so questions of research that have been announced. Sorry, I couldn't catch that. Sorry, I'm saying uh, the leading um, consciousness researcher accepted in the physics of this model, Julio Tononi, is the integrated information theory, which has recently been announced by a hundred of the world's leading consciousness researchers. So this thing about the you know, paradigm shift has been a massive well, Giulio Tononi, his, his integrated information theory is um, no, it's a mathematical theory of consciousness, which is essentially a kind of pan, is usually interpreted as panpsychist because it's not confined just to brains. His theory it could, could apply to any conscious system. Um, I think what's valuable about it is that it emphasizes that consciousness is integrated at any given level. There's a wholeness or unity to it. Um, what he and others, including Christoph Koch, who used to work with Francis Crick. Um, have, have been doing is applying this theory to a kind of panpsychist view of the world. And as you say, this led to a backlash a month or two ago when something like 150 leading materialists uh, wrote a, published a paper, a short paper, branding uh, Tononi's theory pseudoscience. Um, their attempt to brand it pseudoscience is basically saying this, it, you can't discuss it anymore, it's out of bounds, it's heresy. Um, I think that actually what's, that in itself is very interesting because they're desperate. I mean, they, 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 to, they now, they, it's just denialism at the moment. I have the same problems in the research I do on telepathy and the sense of being stared at. It's branded pseudoscience by the so-called skeptics. Um, not because they've looked at the evidence, but because they haven't. And they, um, they simply have to deny these things are possible. The state of the art in, in skepticism, Stephen Pinker, for example, in his book Rationality, actually says um, you don't need to look at any of the evidence for these phenomena because they're simply impossible. Therefore, you know in advance the evidence is flawed. I challenged him to a public debate, and he um, said he... Uh, he turned it down, saying he hadn't got the bandwidth to do it. And I said, why not? And he said, because he'd have to read the evidence if he took part in the <laughs> debate. Um, so it's now it's the same thing, really, with these materialist branding um, inf integrated information theory pseudoscience. It's, I don't personally think it's a very limited theory. Um, but it's, it, what we need in science is a pluralism. What we've got is a kind of dogmatic materialism that has only one valid point of view, namely materialism. And anyone who doesn't agree with this is a heretic and needs drumming out of town. I mean, that's been happened to me, of course. Um, but the, it's, it's a narrow intolerance which still exists very strongly in the academic scientific world, but it doesn't exist very much in the wider culture. And I think as more and more people get interested in these questions, uh, and there's already more and more research on spiritual practices, psychedelics, uh, altered states of consciousness, end-of-life experiences, near-death experiences, and so on. Um, 
as this research goes on, this very narrow view of consciousness is nothing but uh, an epiphenomenon of brain activity or an illusion produced by the brain will become a shrinking position with its strongholds in university psychology departments. Uh, but uh, I think the rest of the world is moving on. And the important thing is that funding bodies aren't intimidated by these reactionary forces. Their aim is to intimidate funders so that all this work gets defunded or no longer funded. Uh, but fortunately, there are now a lot of billionaires who've taken psychedelics and got, <laughs> <laughs> and got very interested in the subject. And much of the research that goes on at the Beckley Foundation and elsewhere is privately funded. For example, Anton Bilton, who's a, a billionaire uh, who's very interested in DMT and who's funded the recent symposia on DMT, is currently funding research on prolonged DMT experiences. DMT experiences only last a minute or two, or a few minutes. He's now, through Imperial College, got a set of volunteers, heroic volunteers, I must say, I wouldn't do this, who are having DMT infused intravenously for half an hour or more. So they're kept in the high point of a DMT experience for half an hour, enabling a much greater ability to report on what's going on. Um, I happen to know about them because I know someone very well who was a volunteer in one of these trials. And I'm, uh, Not only would I not want to do it, but I wouldn't want to be every two minutes uh, interrupted by someone with a clipboard <laughs> <laughs> asking me to rank the transcendence level of my experience on, on a one to nine scale. To, the, to which the, my informant said, you know, he, he responded to the one to nine scale, like, like a hundred. Um, um, so, um, fortunately, they, they, they're, they're not able to suppress it, even though they're trying to. <laughs> one more, yes. Someone at the back there. Um, hi, uh, thank you, first of all, for a phenomenal meeting uh, to the organizer. Um, uh, my question is kind of two parts. Um, so, sure. Yeah. Um, so, in 2020, I had a spontaneous uh, spiritual awakening, um, which uh, rocked my world because I didn't even believe in spirituality, and I knew nothing about what was happening to me. And um, my partner at the time, who was the person I was experiencing this, but the only person who witnessed it really, said it felt like being with LSD, being in, with me. In the time that that happened, I'd never done psychedelics, so I had no idea what that meant. And since, not only am I trying to really understand what happened to me, and what you mentioned about memory and morphic being, I was definitely looking at. Um, but I have since very much entered the world of psychedelics. I know who I am because I'm designing LSD um, magic mushrooms. We talked about a, a shift, a paradigm shift. Um, what is your view on whether this paradigm shift that is happening is happening regardless of our actions? It is happening on a cosmic level, astrologically, universal, Mother Nature guiding us to awakening and embracing these jewels that she has left for us to help and aid our evolution and the speed up of our own evolution. Well, I just don't know is the answer. I mean, <laughs> um, I think, you know, sometimes I think that. Um, I think there's some higher power at work. And, and then you look at the world and you see the war in Ukraine and Israel and Palestine and the Modi government in India with its appalling policies and, you know, repression in China. And so you feel that you know, and, and desperate migrants from Africa, you know, risking their lives in small boats. 
there's a whole lot of the world that doesn't seem to be undergoing this kind of paradigm shift. That where the old morphic fields of sort of war, hatred, vengeance, etc., are still incredibly powerful and just sheer survival um, in very adverse circumstances. So I just don't know. I, I think that you know, I, I think that it's not just something that happens by itself. Those who believe in the power of prayer um, feel that what happens in the world can be influenced by our prayers. And, uh, you know, in, in, I'm a Christian myself, an Anglican, and every day I pray, I meditate every morning, and in the evenings I pray, and I always start with the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Um, and it's really, that does imply some greater will or power at work in the world. It's not always clear what it is or how it's working. Um, but I think we can, um, we can at least hope, and if you pray, pray uh, for uh, positive changes in the world. In fact, there's not a lot else we can do sometimes when things seem desperate. Um, so I think maybe there are greater forces at work, but they're not necessarily astrological. They might be. Not, I don't know much about astrology. Um, but I think there are things that we can also influence through our own attitudes. And indeed, I think we need to uh, have attitudes of hope for the world, because the alternative to hope is despair. Despair literally means désespoir in French. It's the opposite of hope, unhope. We have to have hope, uh, because otherwise we're paralyzed with inaction, and there's no chance of things getting better from a point of view of despair. So personally, I'm hopeful. But Exactly what for? I don't know. <laughs>